Welcome to the 5 a.m. Master Scrum Show. This is our Thursday night edition. We have a great guest here. We have Anton Skornikov, and he's going to talk about his brand new book he's got out. He's all excited. I'm excited for him because it's it's pretty cool. You got a book out there, and he's a certified scrum trainer, business coach, author now. You can officially put author on your list of titles, <laughs> and he's gonna he's publishing a book, The Art of Slicing Work. It'll probably come out pretty close to when this interview comes out so it'll be right on top right on top and you can buy it as soon as you go oh i want to buy the book um you know this is not a classic interview like what is agile how do you do agile what's business and stuff this is more about um learning about anton what's in his book we are going to cover what's in his book and then you know a little about his journey to getting to his book and where he is today so um anton please tell us a little bit about yourself and, you know, share some stuff that's maybe not on LinkedIn or your profiles or, or your bio for your book or something like that. Mm. What, do you, what do you got going on? Oh, well, yeah. First, uh, <laughs> I Greg, and thank you for having me. It's, have You're welcome. Good. It's a great morning uh, we're talking. Um, well, what can you find, what can you not find about me in LinkedIn, I think? And it's, it's I think, maybe even relevant to the book. So... One of the things biographically about me is that I was born in Russia, um, and uh, I, I moved from there with my family almost thirty years ago to Germany. Uh, but uh, you know, with everything that happens right now, and you know, even half of my family originating from Ukraine, you can imagine how how like that that society how society works, and. Uh, what makes it work and what doesn't make it work it's always been on my mind it's not just since the war started uh it's it's always been there so i've been always active in uh non-profit groups or or like d doing voluntary work things like that in order to you know add add my part to society working and it does have um, an impact on my book and and everything we're going to talk about, I guess, today. Because um, you know, one one part of my activity is as is a, is a business coach is actually not working with commercial companies, is actually working and applying the things that we do as uh, as people uh, from the agile world to public organizations that have to adapt to nonprofits that have to adapt. Actually, this need to be able to be adaptable it's not something that is only uh, useful for software developer uh, development uh, environments and uh, and what i find in my practice is that there is a very nice synergy there cuz uh, a lot of um, a lot of the examples a lot of the principles that we use in scrum and agile they are um, you have to break them down and make them very simple and very you know uh, illustrative in order to um, to make to to help people understand what this means, in for example, you know, uh, helping people register or find accommodation or w whatever some nonprofits do or, or or even government organizations do, and where can it be applied, where can it not be applied? So there is w when you create and you break these things down, and you then come back and teach a training for normal scrum masters or, or, or product owners who deal with software products, you suddenly have an amazing amount of, of great examples that are easy to understand and they can then take and then, oh, they can reflect on what they do. Like like you can see eyes lighting up. Oh yeah, right. That's what we do here. Because right? hmm. because technical things that we deal with uh, day, you know, day in, day out, they are often very abstract. You, you don't, it's, it's it's hard to kind of have an eagle eye view on what what's going on here, and uh, and that's that's so that was a long answer I guess to your question about no, biography, it, it, but 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 yeah so, so this kind of so this kind of engagement into thinking about not just you know product development and even software development but but basically how can we be impactful in a healthy society, what whatever organization of humans it is that that we have in front of us how this one can be impactful. Uh, this has always been driving me. Well, that's good. I mean, it's always good to have that drive and everything. I'm actually teaching kids at the local elementary school slash mm -hmm. junior high school, and those grades. And uh, yeah, I can, I can, I can track what you're saying. 
a whole different mm. level. Um, and for me, I have kids that are three year old all the way up to, to 13 year old. So mm -hmm. it's a very diverse, you want to talk about being a flexible <laughs> and, <laughs> and slight adaptable. That's what I do every day. Mm -hmm. Um, or every Friday or Monday. Um, can you share something about, I mean, everyone, you know, they love their certs and they love their trainings. Can you share mm -hmm. something about your journey becoming a certified trainer, you know, a mm. business coach, and now even an author. So talk mm. about that. We get we, we did chat a brief moment about your mm. your journey of becoming an author and where you thought you would be and where you are now. So hopefully <laughs> you'll you'll share that. Right. So I did not start thinking that I would be become an author and I've been warned of, of that by many people. <laughs> Just writing a book is a very long endeavor and I can Totally confirm that. Okay. <laughs> it's not a simple thing. So it's taken four and a half years, I think. But the last two years were very active. Uh, I was very actively writing this book. Uh, and it feels like it's going to take at least another year or two. Be still being involved in the book, but not writing it, but but spreading, spreading the message. Um, so how did I get there? I started out as a physicist. Actually, I've I've done physics and maths in university, and I did uh, did part of of it, which is called stochastical processes, or or you could say random processes. Mm -hmm. And this is a very scientific, and it doesn't have anything to do, you know, on, on kind of. You actually don't think that it has anything to do with reality <laughs> until you come to a part of physics that says that calls itself political and societal physics, where physicists are actually modeling like voter processes or or other processes, and you realize, oh, okay, interesting. But anyway, at some point, I realized still doing all this theoretical stuff in in science, it just does not have enough impact. It's way too kind of distant from from where things are actually happening in the world. So I. Um, just looked for what can I do, so I became an entrepreneur. I, I kind of 2008 was the first startup that I started tried to build in in, in Berlin. Uh, there were several startups, uh, and at some point I realized it's not the particular startup uh, that is actually motivating me. It's actually the way the different startups are built. So I became a coach for startups, did something we called Lean Startup. Then, in those days, Eric Reese's. Mm -hmm. You know, book wasn't even out there. It was just his blog, Startup Lessons Learned. And we basically followed a lot of these lessons. And, and uh, I, I taught a couple of, um, supported basically a couple of other entrepreneurs that I just knew because they were colleagues when I kind of uh, started my own company first. Um, and they basically asked for advice. And, and then at some point, I just basically came along uh, certified scrum trainers. I just came along uh, someone who, who's been doing this for, 10 years and I realized, oh, a lot of the things that I'm teaching to people doing this, they have been already existing for quite some time. And so I kind of moved down this lane. So my 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 entrance into this agile world, you would say, is, is does not come from software. I, even though I understand software, I'm not really a developer. I've mm -hmm. almost never developed my own on, on, on my own. I've always been a founder or kind of managing director looking at the how do we sell? How do we market this thing? How, how, what, what makes sense to customers? What will, you know, this was always my perspective. So I also was quite often, I was a product owner when I, when I worked for okay. other people. Um, and um, basically coached other product owners, created infrastructure for them. And, and then at some point, um, when I, when I, when I kind of started being a trainer and, and uh, did this, you know, in, this, in order to become a trainer, it's an insane journey. You have to have, you have to find other people who are already trainers, and you have to co-train with them until they say, "Well, if I am ill, I would have this guy do do my training." Assignment. Right. Yeah. And that's that's kind of a high high bar to to kind of enter this this thing. And so at some point, so when I when I when I when I when I've done that, I kind of. I, I I kind of understood the way I give trainings is a little different. And I was get, getting this feedback from a lot of participants. So, Anton, you're telling all the stories and they are this kind of societal stories. They're independent of software. So is there any kind of source that we can, you know, you can, you can ah. point us to so we can read about it? And I realized, well, yeah, there's a lot of great books. I mean, there's countless books out there. Right. And many of them are great, but none of them is actually taking this particular perspective. And so in the end, I ended up thinking, okay, well, why don't you, Anton, write a book which is not, it, it, the, the book is actually not addressing the agile crowd 
per se, because right. I'm, I'm, I'm stating that I'm using all the principles from Scrum and Agile in the beginning, but then from there on, the whole book is completely not using any technical jargon. It's, it's actually an attempt to make our principles, our tools, our way of thinking available to other, to other uh, disciplines. So the book uses kind of examples of, you know, Anyway, I'm, 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 again, I'm way past your your question. Ahead, I, I realize I just I was... love my hear myself talking. That's that's a that's a professional problem of a trainer. <laughs> yeah, that, that's fine. No, I I liked it. In, interesting hearing your your story there. Yeah. Um So, okay, we've all seen projects at the brink of failure. You know, at least wasting resources. Uh, you know, I, I saw mm -hmm. that as a. This is how you have. What are they overlooking? Right. Mm -hmm. Can you share how your book helps coaches or organizations get through that, that brink of failure part? Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure you can share a thousand examples as well. Maybe we can we can collect them. But, but yours are different. Is... I want to hear yours. Yeah, your yeah, 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 yeah. Don't don't worry, don't worry. Yeah, sure. So there is a lot of um. So so the main thing that people mostly overlook and and no one is you know e e I do that all the time as well mm -hmm. is very often we just assume we know how things are going to work out. We overlook the one the, the little parts of the project where we do things for the first time. And whenever we do something for the first time it's just there are some surprises that will come up. And when you build software, it's automatic because because almost every software is unique. So so you never even if you're using the same library, even if you're using the same API, someone else done or a thousand other people have done, you are typically doing it, connecting it to something else which has never been there before. So there is something unique about your product, something unique about what you do, and and so surprises will pop up. And when you expect surprises to pop up, there is typical things that are kind of symptoms of organizations that do not expect surprises to pop up and act as if they won't, hmm. but they do. And those symptoms are different because it depends on how the organization kind of deals with them. For example, one of the symptoms is very often is something we call crunch time. So a project would be going very smoothly and we would plan and analyze and then we do, but in the end we realize all of those uh, surprises that have actually been accumulating throughout the whole project, they kind of surface. But right at the very end so we are we're not gonna hit our deadlines so we create kind of a war zone or yeah. code yellow i've called it I've, I've heard so many names for this and basically it's taking people who actually can do the work and have the ability to decide most mostly all the seniors put them into one room close the room and say guys you're gonna work you're gonna make it you know you're, you're gonna make it happen in the next week yeah or or and 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 this is, I've I've heard. I mean, this is this is so standard that at Google, I think they have this code yellow. This is basically a standard name for this, mm. uh, for, for this practice. And and this practice is, I mean, it. When you've seen this, you know that in this code yellow, things get done. And you've seen that you've seen that in this code yellow, people make actually very important decisions. And one way of looking at you know Scrum or Agile working is. Well, why don't we have that kind of working where things actually get done, but without all the stress involved and not, you know, you know, not do that. This is one of the patterns. Another pattern is that we just have, <laughs> we call it the watermelon color of projects, like where, where people, you know, where, where they have this big project reporting tools and they have the, the colors of, um, of traffic lights to show whether something is going right or not. Right, and so so something is green, right? It goes well. So you are at this big reporting meeting with 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 big sponsors, and and things all look okay, right? There, a lot of them are green, and some of them maybe a yellow, but most of them are green. But then when you, you when you kind of unravel what is behind this big point that is green, you will see all the things that are red. So that's where the watermelon color comes from, right? It's it's, it's green from the outside, red inside. This is another typical way of of, of seeing the symptoms of organizations not expecting surprises to happen and dealing with them and in the end it's kind of it's always it's always a pain um because you will realize that a lot of the things that you do are wasteful i just just not in, and, and a lot of people who are working within a project for example sitting in a meeting and thinking 
while we are negotiating right now about a lot of details about something that's going to happen in a year from now. And a lot of people know, well, that's not going to matter. You know, a lot of the things that we talk about right now, they're not going to matter. But we're still doing it because, you know, Headcounts depend on it. Potential power depend on it. So how do you get out of that? How do you give, give us mm-hmm. an example from your book? How do you mm-hmm. gave some examples where things are going wrong? What do you do differently in your book? Well, so so the book is basically proposing the one skill that typically a lot of agile practitioners are really good at already. But this is this book is enlarging uh, or teaching the skill to any kind of subject matter, not only okay. software or not only, and. The idea to not have this meeting where you would, you know, have this artificial negotiations or, or they're not artificial, but, but negotiations that don't matter in the end uh, is to think about, you know, what is the one little thing that we can deliver in a couple of weeks mm-hmm. that will give us some useful, that will give us some useful progress. And the question is, what is this useful progress? And for, for, for many projects, um, or, or let's let put it this way. I, I'm I'm using a lot of simple areas in my book mm-hmm. to show what this means, and I'm like the, the example of what does it mean to slice work. It like if we if we if we look at, for example, preparing a dinner for a lot of guests, and you can break this dinner preparation into two different kind of lists. The one list is the list of all the things that your guests will be able to to taste, like all the dishes, maybe the drinks, maybe the dips, maybe. Um, side dishes, every, every little thing that someone can take into their mouth and say, mm, no, I, I would love to have that on the dinner on the dinner table. That's going to taste great. That's one kind of breakup. And the other breakup is the breakup of the work in the different um, activities that you want to do to prepare the dinner, right? To, to wash the vegetables, cut them, slice them, uh, add some... Uh, some salt and vinegar or, or and, and so forth, right? So to so, so the other list would be the list of all the activities. And slicing work is the breakup of work into those dishes. Because when you think about them, they behave very differently. It's a very simple example, but you can already think about, you know, you, you could apply it to your normal life. Because when you think, for example, about mm, what happens if you, you know, if, if, if you are, uh, like, like you said, you have kids, me too. Like when I prepare a dinner, it can happen that something will turn up and I will have to, to attend to my kids and won't have that much time to cook, yep. right? Yeah. So I kind of plan to cook for six hours, but now I realize, well, two of my six hours are gone already. So I only have four hours. So which of the two lists, the list of the dishes or the list of the activities is going to be helpful when I think about reducing the scope of my dinner, mm-hmm. right? I cannot just say, oh, well, I will not, I don't know, clean my knife. I will not uh, season the vegetables. That, that's not going to work. Uh, right. What I can only do is actually reduce the whole dish. And then I can think about whether which of the lists, items for which list do I want to delegate, right? And to whom? Like if, if it's my spouse and she can cook, I will delegate the whole dish to her, right? Hmm. She could do all of the uh, baked potatoes. In fact, it could be the other ways around, right? Or... Or if if um, if it's my kids helping me out, I wouldn't tell ask them to do all the fried potatoes on their own. I would ask them to you know peel the potatoes and then I would check them. But that has far implica- far reaching implications on how much they can innovate, right? When, when right. you when you when you you know peel potatoes, there's not much innovation space. But when you actually have to do the whole dish yourself, well, you, there is a lot of freedom. You can add some ingredients. You can add some interesting stuff, and. And when you think about this, like the two different kind of lists, the horizontal list of the activities and the vertical list of um, of the dishes, you already realize, oh, this is different. But in most projects that we talk about in work, in nonprofits, government, or software companies, the slicing isn't as simple as, as with the dinner example. So you can see how it's useful, right. but it's much harder to see, well, in this three-year project, what is going to be a slice of work that I could deliver in two weeks? Mm-hmm. And that's a very important question, and um, there are a lot of you know software in, in software. There is already a lot of mm-hmm. tools and, and 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 practices that help us with that, I, like walking skeleton scheme or the tracer bullet scheme, the um, 
the elephant carpaccio exercise created yeah. by Alistair Coburn, great, like a lot of great stuff that has been created uh, that is out there. And if you if you've been practicing uh, agility, you know kind of things that you could do right. to to slice your stuff. You know, we have the splitting cheat sheet. And but 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 um, if you are outside of software, you're just there, and someone tells you, well, why don't you try to develop to deliver something in two weeks, and you learn from it. But normally, if you, if you just say, what can I deliver in two weeks, you will end up with just some, you know, I could create a concept in two weeks, and then I can show it to someone. Is that a, is that a valid vertical slice? Most of the time, no, no. Because just creating a concept, it won't give you any meaningful feedback. You won't be able to get this feedback. So, so, so to your question, so what does my book, how does my book help? It teaches, in this complicated uh, project, it teaches people to create those little slices that can bring meaningful feedback to allow learning and you know start from the very beginning to to actually deliver something and learn something as a team so, so that kind of answered my next question i was gonna ask, what does it oh, mean to slice work right uh -huh. how, do you, how do you slice the work so so mm -hmm. that's good and i was actually thinking as you were doing that i was talking about um mm -hmm. when you started talking about cooking it's like you can have a slicer you can make the vegetables and you got a potato you got a meat or a salad, and the, and the key is getting all the slices to show up at the plate at the same time, right? Because mm -hmm. you don't want anything cold. It's all going to be hot at the same time. I mean, if you cook the vegetables two hours early, they're going to be cold as ice by the time. Or That's you right. definitely don't want the meat or whatever cooked two hours early, and it's cold, and then all the vegetables come out all nice and warm. So it's mm -hmm. the real key is that you slice it up, but now they all got to show up at the same time. Which is, mm -hmm. a, I think, goes to what you said. You just, I can do this, but does that really get you any value, right? Yeah, and especially imagine you did something wrong when you've done the, the meat two hours earlier, and then you only find out two hours, two hours later when right. you add everything up, and then suddenly you know, oh no, I have to. No, and that's that's what we call delayed feedback. <laughs> now, now it sounds like we're talking about Hell's Kitchen with uh, Gordon Ramsay and his cooking, kitchen contest. He's like, it's all not right. Do it over. Um, <laughs> heard that before. Um, so notice in one of your chapters, you titled mm -hmm. Emotional Resistance to Feedback, which I, mm -hmm. I thought was really interesting title. Emotional, mm. emotional resistance to feedback. It's mm. like, I've seen that. Um, can you share any insights from that chapter? Sure. So one of the, <laughs> one of the resistances that I see in my work when I explain to people the the general you know cognitive concept, well, you just slice it and then you can learn and you can get feedback. Mm -hmm. the, the 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 actual difficulty in 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 real application of this is, well, mo many organizations they kind of generally easily understand that concept, but you know they're afraid of actually getting feedback. Like when you are used to delivering a product in a in a in a condition that it is already polished. It's as if it's something laying on the shelf of a supermarket. Right. But suddenly someone tells you, well, you can gain a lot if you just show them, you know, your product a little bit partially done mm -hmm. and, and put it in front of customers. A lot of organizations, a lot of people in organizations are just afraid because they think people will give them negative feedback because the problem the product isn't as polished as your clients are used to. Yeah. And actually that's feedback. I mean, this is this is a valid fear. Um, but clients typically learn learn about it very fast, and then you you, you can you know move, move 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 further. And so, when an organization is actually starting to do this whole slicing thing and actually starts learning, there is all the different areas where feedback suddenly becomes important. And um, in the book, I'm basically giving people three tools that I use most. They're not you know the only tools. By, by no means, mm -hmm. but the tools that I le use most um, when it comes to giving and receiving feedback, yeah, uh, in different in different areas. So one of them is, um, it's, it's it's the perfecting game from the clean, uh, the, not from the uh, clean language. Clean language is uh, clean feedback is the second one, but the first one is the perfecting game from the uh, core protocols, right? So if you're familiar with core protocols like check in and and others, there's a, this perfecting game protocol there, which basically says. Uh, and you can use it for for small little things, mm -hmm. right? So, if you, for example, if you think about our uh, podcast right now, so right. a listener after the podcast could say, "Well, how many points of out of ten would you give this podcast?" And um, 
and for every point that you do not give so so if you say it's 10 out of 10 you can it's it's great then mm -hmm. then it's just perfect for you but if you say it's like 7 out of 10 you need to find three points that we can do to improve it so it will become a 10 out of 10 so this way it's kind of the perfecting game is kind of to help help me perfect what i'm doing and it is kind of expecting the feedback giver to be constructive by the, this way um, that works pretty pretty well for small things, in my experience. For larger things, or especially for things that you created as a group, uh, the absolutely magical format that I've ever like th this this works every time. And but it's hard to take in the first like when you do it first. It's co something called the Ritual Descent, which is uh, developed by Dave Snowden, okay. the author of uh, the Kinevin Framework. Um, and uh, it's basically a format where, for example, you have a concept, you have a business model, you have your business idea or you have an, a product idea and you've developed it with some people and you present it to a crowd and then you ask them to destroy it. Oh. And you turn around, you turn around, you, you, they do not see your face or if you do it online, you, you basically mm -hmm. turn off your camera and, and, and your mic and you just take notes while these people talk to each other trying to like you ask them really imagine this idea is the kind of the the the, the highest risk that there is right in your career imagine you have to destroy it please find all the weak points you can and then they will they will find a lot of weak points and some of the weak points will be things that you think well they misunderstood the idea or they, yeah. they, 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 they may be not qualified to to comment on something that's fine they just gonna destroy it with every they're just gonna go at it with everything they have and that's really helpful to you because you will then note down whatever is helpful. And then after like four or five minutes, you say, thank you so thank you very much. And then move on. Okay. It, and it suddenly like you that. got, yeah, it, it suddenly you got so many things. And the, the, what, what makes it easy is the ritualness part. So yeah. everyone knows it's a ritual. It's not about, you know, anyone destroying an idea right. of a friend. It's, it's a ritual that we're playing with each other. Yeah. And it's to help prepare the other person. I mean, once you yeah. get there, you're you're helping the other person, the other group of people, be prepared yeah. for whatever can come down the pike. Which we said, change happens, stuff happens, right? Um, mm. So vertically slicing your project, and I'm talking about projects. You know, we've heard this before. Um, what can? Because we always talk about hearing this cake, and you slice all the way through, so you get a nice slice of yeah. cake. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's a classic one, right? So, what new insight can we gain from this chapter in your book? So, so this is the chapter which basically explains how to do it. Okay. Right. So, so there is a step-by-step -step guide which is independent of the subject matter that you are dealing with. Mm -hmm. That helps you first. Like, okay, let's start. Let's start there. So, what does it look like when you actually navigate your project in uncertain ways? So like, what is the metaphor? Because that's a, that's an interesting thing. Whenever um, you know, whenever we humans are actually dealing with something abstract, we kind of need a metaphor that we can touch, that we can grasp. And so the metaphor that I'm using in my book is basically, what if you were a sailor in the 16th century and you were sailing a ship from, say, Europe to America? And you know the general direction where you want to go. You want to, you, you know, you want to end up in New York Harbor. But you have no idea what is going to happen on your way, where the winds are going to blow, uh, maybe an iceberg, maybe uh, an underwater current, maybe huge waves, dangerous waves are uh, are going to come your way. And maybe so, a sea monster. A sea monster, yeah, you don't know, you don't know. Maybe a sea monster. So what you have as a captain or, or a navigator of such a ship, you have a general idea of the direction where you want to go, right? That's kind of the goal. The second thing that you have is you have a map. It's not a. It's not as, as you know as as concrete as the terrain, but you have a map, and you have a way of finding out where you are. Yeah, using the stars, and that's basically what you want to have in such a project. So what you want to have is, the, and, and that's something kind of, what is laid out in this in this chapter. First, a very simple way to get to a goal that is good enough to start. So what is a good enough way to just say, okay, this is my direction, then a way of creating a map, which allows you to identify like set a direction for one day because that's what a navigator does right so he says okay now taking into account where i see how the sea sea looks like and where the rifts are and, and so forth today we're going to take this direction and then there is a process which basically 
allows you to deliver something in a couple of weeks and then find out where are you on the map. Are your customers happy? What is what is where are you kind of? What is mm-hmm. what is the movement that you've that you've made? And um, so taking this metaphor into account, what does this chapter g- gives us? This chapter allows um, so basically gives you you know a step by step guide to to vertically slice, and it's. it's too exhaustive to 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 do this here in the, in the podcast, but kind of the main steps are, or the main aha moment is in, in in my experience working with a lot of people in training is is start with the risks instead of instead of um, thinking what is going to be kind of um, a step by step way of you creating what you th- set out to create. Think about what you set out to create in the beginning, and then ask yourself. Imagine it fails. How did it fail? Like imagine yourself two years ago, you want to, I don't know, typical project people work on on us, digitalize an agency, digitalize some processes. People are using paper today. Tomorrow they're going to use your tool. So imagine in two years from now, your tool is there, but it, no one uses it. It, it. Your project failed. How did it fail? You know, no one uses it. It does not show the right processes, all of the different things. And then you ask yourself, so how do I prove that those risks that I just came up with, those risks that are actually there, how do I prove that they are not there anymore? What is the little thing that I can deliver that shows this? And suddenly you will come up with things that maybe do not involve that much coding in the beginning, mm-hmm. but will actually help you ensure that you do not start with wasteful coding of things that will you, 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 you will then afterwards have to throw away. And and if you if you basically if you kind of start with the begin with the end in mind, it's it's also very uh, not something I developed. It's it's one of those um, habits of very effective people, right. very famous book, right? So, but if you start that and kind of how it, it, the the method that I'm talking about, it kind of teaches you to stay there, to stay always think with the end in mind, and this way, um, you know, just use a couple of patterns to to to, to uh, reduce the size of what you're delivering there. And this way you can always find something really useful, really uh, worthy of feedback that you can create with a small team in a couple of, uh, in, in, in a week or two. Okay. And, and and that's basically what this, yeah, what this chapter is helping you. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, now I want to ask you, do, every, do you, have, you, talk, you said there's lots of stories in your book. Yeah. Um, can you share a brief story, a journey story that you captured yeah. in your book? Yeah. There's one story. So, so the stories of my book, they are very close to the reality, but most of them are derived from several customers because I'm not allowed to talk about, you know, customers, internal company mm-hmm. working. But one one of the stories that I love most actually because it's, um, you know, it's quite impactful and uh, it is kind of taking people out of the normal understanding of, of you know, software is, is a story about an um, actually government agency that is responsible for housing uh, homeless people. And refugees, and they are, you know, like if if we if we just think about that, like you know, they, there's several several hundreds of people working there, and there is one team um, that is responsible for you know getting those buildings where people would live in. And suddenly they have this problem. There is a war break that, that breaks out, and, and and there's thousands of people standing on the street, and they they need to find housing for them very soon. And they have some standard procedures. So if if nothing out of the ordinary happens, they would put uh, in place a lot of containers somewhere outside of town, and people would live in this kind of really minimal house housing housing containers. Mm-hmm. And this is, you know, this this is better than them being on the street, but it's not allowing them really to be integrated in the society, find jobs and and actually not be dependent on the on the government anymore because that's that's what this you know agency is actually trying to do, right? It's right. trying to enable people to get as as fast as possible to be contributing to the society. And so there is one idea that pops up. So why don't we since we already have hundreds of buildings where people are living, why don't we look for ways that for people who already live in our buildings to maybe welcome some of the new, new uh, some of the new people who are who, who just came to our country into their homes, even though they would have not enough space, not not kind of the minimal required space, they may still have enough 
for them to live, but they may kind of benefit from each other living in the same flat. They, they mm -hmm. may benefit from sharing a flat. For example, um, a single mother with a kid would benefit from another single mother moving into the same flat because this way they they, they could take care of the kids um, you know, w w while the other one is working. Or, uh, or elderly people may accept someone in their flat who would help them uh, getting through the day right, right. So, so so there is different scenarios that could work between people so this is the, basically their idea right so the normal way how this would work in a government entity is uh there would be a lot of experts dealing with it. so so the architect would think where are enough rooms for this uh social people would work facility manager there so there is a huge amount of experts that would think about a concept for this mm -hmm. they would negotiate they would confirm but there would be a decision this would take several months and then after several months have been taken someone would try out to roll out this concept so that's the normal way that obviously doesn't work because people are on the street right now kind of and and they have to kind of act and so the idea what they what they're doing is they're saying okay well why don't we try to house just five people this week five people in an existing building we just take one building and we just try to do that we look for people who would be open to this to welcome new people and we would look for refugees who are open to you know accepting not living in a container building but with less space so why don't we just try to do that and then they go and they talk to people they create they, they they realize what kind of an agreement, what kind of you know document uh, they they have to draft in order for people to si uh, to sign, and and they, they kind of figure out all the details on the on the way, with obviously cross functional team kind of because they need all of those expertises in there, and then um, after one week they realize of the five people that they tried to house, mm -hmm. only two of them or one of them, they actually succeeded, and three didn't. Right, but they now realize, oh, what we thought that with this this thing with the single women and and uh, with with kids, it didn't work out. They didn't want anyone. To. But the elderly thing that worked out pretty well. So you the get your feedback uh, loops going. Absolutely, and the learning, and and suddenly you realize, oh yeah, and those things you would never have learned them in a concept phase, and suddenly, and and kind of next week you you try the same thing with two buildings using the learnings from the first week. Mm -hmm. And so week after week, you actually house people and you learn from the process. And you, in the end, after a couple of weeks, you have a kind of a guide. You, you've created documents. You've created ways of doing this empirically, learned it. And, you know, so for, for a Scrum practitioner, this looks like, yeah, right. That's basically what a, what a, what a Scrum team does, right? Yeah. That's that's exactly that's exactly our process. But just seeing that this is possible in a completely different area, uh, those examples they are kind of, to me they they are they're great because because I believe when people see a lot of them they will realize there is a huge amount of application, a huge amount of f uh, of fields where we can apply these practices where they are not applied today, where yeah. where there is not even an infrastructure to apply them today. And to be honest, the, those government agencies that I work with, they only do that because there is no other way for them. Because the government, like, like the laws in no country in the world are the laws right now governing um, how administration works, actually thinking of a, an agile government, or at least I don't know of any uh, agile government really. Like, many of them are actually interested in that, but no one knows how to do that. But in some places, where just normal standard processes don't work, uh, government agencies are, I think are, are looking for ways to do it any effectively anyway. So they're kind of asking for support of people like us. Yeah, I think it's a little difficult in this country where if you deviate from your standard process, we're going to sue you because you deviated from your accepted process, and that that's put, and that that's puts the a thing. fear yeah. that like oh we can't we make a mistake you know everything's going to go wrong. Well, things do do go wrong. I actually, yeah. anyway, <laughs> going oh, on. please tell. I go in a rat hole on that one. I heard someone comment about if you, I was talking about rockets going off here in the States, and if mm. it doesn't work as exactly as planned, we're going to have to investigate the whole thing. Well, it's the first time it went off, it's not going to go as planned. Mm. It by definition, it ain't going to do it. You know, mm. I mean, yeah, we need to investigate it, but don't like, oh, we, we got to start over from scratch. I'm like, well. You know, that, that's where you don't get that. And we have a migration problem right now in the States. And sure. I think they're trying to figure that process. That's why when you said that was interesting, it kind of related to what we're dealing with right now, too, as well as Europe. Mm -hmm. 
but for different causes, let's say. Well, um, I think the uh, yeah, 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 it's a big political topic, but I think yeah. it's not going anywhere. This this question of people trying to find new homes because yeah, they cannot it's, live. It's where the they... mass migration. It makes things so. It's mm -hmm. a lot right now, <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's kind of hard. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so is there anything that you would like to share about your book? Um, I noticed you have a training series. Did you mm -hmm. create the training series before or during or part of the book process? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this is a good one because because <laughs> I was asked. So Anton, how did you apply your own? You know, like what you're teaching people in the book to you to your own mm -hmm. work? Like to the, did you apply this to the book? And so so the hmm, so I did I did. I'm uh, right now having finished the book or almost finished the book. It's it's going to appear in a couple of weeks, but it, it having almost finished the book, I realize how much more I could have applied it, but um, I've applied, so, so it, and this is very much connected to your, to your question. So first, the first thing that, that, that was there were just general trainings. Then I realized there is this, you know, slicing work as a technique that I can train people. Mm -hmm. And I actually created a training for that. I, I, I run this uh, three years ago or something, I think, last time, three or four years ago, so quite, quite some time, um, to test whether the tools that are going to show people where the concepts the stories the, whether they work well or not and uh well some of the things worked and many of the things didn't so that that's the way it always is right. so you, you won't find all the things that failed in the book right but then i realized i don't want to do it you know in an individual training i basically integrated those um content into my general you know scrum master and product owner trainings so so basically, there is a lot of um, so. So when you do a product owner or a scrum master training with me, you you will you will learn the concept of slicing work, and we'll do a lot of things that are connected to it. However, uh, once the book is there, I realize if someone is actually interested in not becoming, you know, if they're not interested in scrum at all, they're not mm -hmm. interested in becoming a product owner or a scrum master. They just want to learn the skill. Then me just you know teaching them the standard Scrum Master stuff that that would you know reduce the value that they have. So I basically said, well we can spend uh, basically it's one and a half or two days you could say uh, um, just just practicing those techniques and actually having people uh, a space where they can come with their own project that we're working on right now and just for the sake of it just try to slice it with other people. And, uh, you know, just do it, try, try it first on, on, on an example project, understand the principles, and then try to do it with your own project. And, uh, yeah, you can yeah, do Yeah, and that. I think that's that's great because, you know, there, there's a big audience already, ha already scrum masters, already product owners, right? But they didn't learn your slicing technique. So yeah. I always think of this as a accelerator or add-on to their basic because they Absolutely. don't want to sit through a whole nother scrum class of two days or whatever just to get you one slice of your mm -hmm. your 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 background right so now mm -hmm. you're helping that too you help people that i don't have any interest in becoming a certified scrum master or whatever mm -hmm. i just want to learn this technique for my my marketing for my business side for my whatever you know mm -hmm. small businesses or, or non-profits like you said how can i take care of these surges how do i do that so so mm -hmm. I think that's that's awesome. Um, so lastly, how can people get in touch with you? You know, get your book, um, follow mm -hmm. up with what whatever you're doing. Well, if, you, track if, if you. what you heard is, is is interesting to you, just go to slicingwork.com. There, there is a link to the book. There is blog uh, blog articles. Uh, there is other inf info and and uh, newsletter as well. So you you'll find a lot of information on slicingwork.com. Okay. What about? Well, you have LinkedIn too. You're on LinkedIn. They sure. Yeah. Yeah. You. you can find me on LinkedIn. You can contact me. There is there is a website of my own company, Agile Coach, Coach, um, in, in in Germany. Um, sure. You can you can you can find me that. But but if you are kind of you know if 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 what we just talked about sounds like the, the interesting thing to you, the specific website would be slicingwork.com. And you can all you can also find you know an email address there. So you can buy the book. And then you get trained in it and get some you real can life. The you, book, can you can get, get trained, your vision you can... on it and then have the expert teach you and how it yep. works and get it all to solidify and how you want to apply it and everything like that. So, yep. that, so that's great. Well, Anton, thank you very much for coming on 
the show today and sharing with you um, your book that's coming out. You know, I encourage everyone to learn and maybe even take one of your classes to get a get a feel for what what how this really gets applied. Once you read it, you visualize it, do it in the class, and then go from there. Thank you so much, Craig. Well, thank you. <laughs>